start and okay uh, good morning good afternoon and good evening to you all from all of the world thanks for joining the fmg event on this uh, uh, important issue legal uh, aspect of investment facilitation uh, polyhedral uh, agreement uh, of course, we understand that uh, the plurilateral negotiations under the name of uh, joint statement initiatives, GSIs, is quite a phenomenon uh, within the organization uh, with a lot of issues ongoing uh, on various uh, aspects of, of and subjects. Of course, the, their relation to the multilateral trading system and if they reached something achieve something, how to incorporate them into the legal framework of the organization remains quite an issue. And on that, we do see different opinions. Uh, so that's why FMG for quite some time has been following this closely. And our members in particular, Hamid has done a lot of research on that. And uh, so that's why we hope to through our, to use our platform to organize sessions like this uh, uh, to, to put together experts uh, with different opinions uh, and so as to see what are the challenges and how, how to resolve them. Uh, in particular, we are very glad to have Jim with us, not only because she, as Hamid, has always has constantly researching on these uh, plurilaterals and their different aspects, but uh, also because she's joining us from Auckland and it's three o'clock for her in the morning. So we are really touched when she said yes to our invitation. So with that, I will just stop, but ask all those of you who uh, are not going to speak, please turn uh, off your audio on, until you are invited to speak. And with that, I give floor to Mercedes, who is going to moderate the session uh, today. And thanks to you all, and uh, looking forward to a, a, rich, a rich discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. And. Uh... Well, I don't want to take all the time, but the discussions that we have today are people that really know how the institutionality of WTO works and also have very strong points of view about these issues on investment facilitation. The two background papers are quite interesting. They are different points of view and the discussion I think will be rich based on that. So based on this, I would like to present Hamid who is gonna do the first presentation please go through his, his uh, uh, background in our presentation that we sent it through the, the mail, and but really listen to their proposals because they're quite interesting based on outcome, possible outcomes that may have come from this uh, new investment facilitation agreement. Thank you, Hamid, you have 15 minutes. Well, thank you, thank you so much and uh, good afternoon or good morning everyone, wherever you are. I. Uh, I think uh, there is an interesting story behind this investment facilitation. I uh, would agree very much with what Lou has said about the broader context in which um, this conversation takes place and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Whether it's about JSIs in general or uh, the, the discussion on plurilateral negotiations and outcomes and how that relates to WTO reform efforts and current discussions, all that. This is sort of a, a broader picture or a backdrop that we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, however, focusing on investment facilitation, it's an interesting um, story because uh, I remember this whole thing started really um, in the G20 discussions under the Chinese presidency uh, way back in, um, in 2016. And the first conversation was really about trade and investment policy coherence. Uh, and how, how this overlap between trade policy as redefined by the WTO to include services trade as well, uh, not only interfaces closely with, uh, with, with investment policy, but that there is uh, an overlap, even a legal overlap because the GATS as a multilateral agreement covers FDI and services uh, to the extent it is for the purpose of supplying services as defined under the agreement. And given the fact that for, for many years now, almost two thirds of global FDI stock is in services sectors, 
Now that actual real life overlap created a certain realization among G20 that you know, we need to have a conversation about coherence between the two policies. Now that, to, to, to make a long story short, that conversation moved into the WTO the following year, 2017, and then uh, an interesting uh, wave started, which is the interest by developing countries and LDCs who are so keen on uh, attracting foreign direct investment uh, started what they called at the time the Friends of Investment Facilitation for Development. It's a group called Friends of Investment Facilitation for Development. And the whole conversation there was about how um, do we best facilitate um, uh, uh, FDI flows to developing countries and LDCs. And that conversation actually uh, went on until MC11 in Buenos Aires where um, about 70 WTO members have decided that they would want to have a structured conversation to explore the possibilities of promoting uh, uh, investment facilitation in the WTO, which later on turned into an actual negotiation. That br brought us to the point where we we started discussing, okay, what would be the legal basis for integrating an outcome coming out of that process into the WTO treaty architecture? Now, of course, um, as Lou said, this process is plurilateral i.e. by definition, a subset of the membership. It's not the entire membership that are participating. Currently, there's more than 100 uh, WTO members. Um, most of them are developing countries and LDCs. Uh, but while the process is plurilateral, the outcome need not necessarily be so. Now, we will get to that in a minute. And when I was asked to look into this and, and, and provide uh, an opinion on the legal aspects and the nuts and bolts of uh, how this might uh, happen, uh, I thought that, that, that the first thing we need to, to um, look at would be the working assumptions uh, uh, on which those negotiations were based. Um, and you know, you go back to the, the ministerial statement um, launching the negotiations among a group of members. You see that point number one that um, this negotiations cover only FDI, not other uh, types of investment, not portfolio investment, not, not equity types of investment, uh, different sorts that we know, just foreign direct investment. And um, it addresses regulations that only relate to foreign direct investment and not necessarily regulations that, um, that uh, are designed to regulate activities of such investment. So if we take um, uh, an FDI in banking, for example, then this process is only negotiating uh, in relation to uh, the, the FDI regulations that relate to investment and not to banking regulations per se. Now, the second uh, uh, working assumption is that the outcome should be part of the WTO treaty system. Uh, the third is that it should be legally binding on those members who commit to it. The fourth is that the outcome would be applied on a most favored nation basis. And here it, it is to emphasize that um, it, 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 the outcome is presumed to create rights for non-participants, for non-signatories. It's not just about um, the signatories of such an outcome would voluntarily extend uh, the same treatment to non-signatories. No, it's about the agreement stipulating that signatories would have an obligation to extend uh, the treatment provided for in the agreement to uh, all other members, including non-signatories. And then um, the final assumption is that the agreement should be open for future acceptance by any 
non-signatory. Now, looking at the options for integrating negotiating outcomes, and as you will see from the paper, uh, there, there, are, there are two main pathways uh, as I try to describe them. The first pathway really is the scheduling of commitments that are negotiated under the auspices of existing agreements, namely the GAT and the GATS. And this second option or the second pathway is integrating a new standalone agreement into the treaty architecture of the WTO. These are the, the two main pathways to integrate any kind of negotiating outcome uh, uh, in the WTO. And um, as you see in the paper, I examined quickly and very briefly actually, actually the scheduling option, which is scheduling commitments under the GATT and the GATS. Uh, that is turning or transforming the provisions that are currently under negotiation uh, on investment facilitation into uh, commitments to be scheduled under the GATT and the GATS. Now, uh, obviously there is a great limitation in that option. Why? Because uh, anything that would be scheduled under the GATT or the GATS eventually, of course, would become an integral part of that agreement in itself, and therefore would be governed by all provisions in that agreement, GATT or the GATS, including those relating to the scope of application. So if you look at the GATT, for example, the scope of application does not extend to investors or producers of products. It only covers the treatment of products crossing border and um, the treatment of such products once they enter a member's territory in terms of non-discrimination uh, and all the other uh, provisions in the GATT, but it does not extend to the treatment of uh, uh, producers or, or, or FDI uh, 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 interests. Under the GATS, however, the scope is very different because the GATS treats products as well as producers, services as well as service suppliers. Um, and that would cover FDI situations, uh, but it would cover FDI situations only when the FDI in question qualifies as a service supplier of another member. Because if you look at the provisions of the GATS, they apply to services and service suppliers of other members, which means that uh, uh, the, 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 the scope of application of the GATS to um, the FDI universe that is being discussed under these negotiations um, would be much more limited. So the long and short of it really is that the scheduling option uh, would not be an optimal pathway to cover the, um, the, the scope of what is currently being negotiated uh, uh, under investment facilitation. Now, of course, the, what is being discussed uh, in uh, the investment facilitation negotiations uh, is only about transparency of investment regulation and about speeding up uh, and simplifying administrative procedures. So it's important always to keep in mind that what is being negotiated does not actually address the, um, uh, the, the substantive aspects of uh, uh, investment policies, uh, be it market access for investors, um, uh, investor, uh, investment protection provisions, or um, uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement. And I think from the very beginning, it was made very clear that these negotiations do not cover those uh, uh, aspects of, of policy. So, Concerns about policy space for negotiating members has been present throughout um, the negotiations. Now, uh, I went into some further detail um, just to clarify what a scheduling option uh, would entail by, by way of certification of schedules, which is uh, a legal procedure that is uh, has the advantage of being less demanding uh, than an amendment procedure. But at the end of the day, uh, the examination of the scheduling uh, option 
uh, or pathway led to the conclusion that uh, this is not really an optimal um, solution for the integration of the outcome of these negotiations into the GATS, uh, sorry, into the WTO. Now, the, the, the second pathway, which is integrating um, the agreement uh, as a standalone agreement in the WTO uh, legal architecture, uh, is the one that, that, in my view, represents the viable approach. Now, of course, um, anything that uh, is not by way of scheduling new commitments, i.e. by way of introducing a new standalone agreement into the WTO would have to be based on a consensus uh, agreement by the entire membership. The legal procedures for that are very clear and very well defined um, in Article 10 of the WTO agreement. And I, in the paper, as you will see, I summarize the, the, the steps that are involved in, in this kind of a process uh, and um, raise the question about, okay, if this is the path uh, way to be taken, in which of the annexes under the WTO agreement would the investment facilitation for development agreement be ideally uh, annexed. And of course, the, we, we always recall whether intentionally or unintentionally our experience with the trade facilitation agreement, which was annexed uh, or inserted in Annex 1 to the WTO agreement. But then in examining um, the current situation, you immediately find that the two annexes that contain substantive agreements in the WTO, i.e. Annex 1 and Annex 4, are characterized in a way that does not really uh, match very much the kind of working assumptions that we were talking about with respect to um, the investment facilitation agreement. Namely that in Annex 1, um, it, as it is referred to in Article 2 of the WTO agreement, this is only about agreements that are binding on all members. So it is not expected at least in the immediate future, or once negotiations are concluded, that the investment facilitation agreement would be binding on all members. Annex 4, however, um, characterizes agreements uh, included there as uh, not creating rights for non-members nor imposing obligations on uh, non-signatories. Uh, but this also does not match the, the working assumption that I mentioned in the beginning, which is that the investment facilitation agreement would be uh, not binding on all members, but creating rights for all members. And that led me to the uh, idea that perhaps um, it might be worth considering adding an Annex 5 to the WTO agreement, which will be um, housing new kind of agreements that are not binding on all, but creating rights for all. Now, this would be a little bit novel in terms of the treaty architecture, but however, the concept itself of having negotiations that produce outcomes that are not evenly binding on all members is not a new concept in the multilateral trading system. We have this same concept applying and a lot of plurilateral negotiations, even those taking place under existing agreements like the GATT and the GATS. And we have so many examples from financial services to telecommunications to the information technology agreement uh, uh, on, on tariff reductions. Uh, the concept of reaching outcomes that are binding on some but benefiting others in itself is, is not new. It's just the form in which this time it would take uh, uh, effect is new in the sense that it is a new uh, uh, standalone agreement in that respect. Now, of course, there are there are political questions to be concerned, just to be discussed. And and as I said, um, this conversation is taking place against the backdrop of a, of a bigger picture in the system, including how members want the WTO negotiating function to proceed? Um, what is the future 
of that function in their minds and how negotiated outcomes uh, would be integrated into the system uh, while preserving the rights uh, uh, of all members uh, and making sure that the system actually operates in a way that is relevant to the real world as, as we see it today. And one of the ideas that uh, I, I put in the paper as well is that um, concluding the negotiations on investment facilitation might not be um, uh, happening at the same time uh, when members take any decisions on WTO reform, for example. And therefore, the legal solution for integrating such an outcome into the WTO treaty system might, might not be ripe at the time of concluding the negotiations. And therefore, one way that might be explored by participants in these negotiations is to consider the uh, provisional application of uh, an investment um, uh, facilitation for development agreement uh, pending its entry into force once it becomes um, uh, agreed by members and once it gains the consent of the entire membership through the defined rules and procedures that we have in, uh, in the WTO agreement itself. Now, uh, th there is a bit more to unpack into the story, but in the interest of time, let me stop here and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing the, the discussions as well as getting questions from the floor. So back to you, Mercedes, and thank you very much. Thank you, Hamid, very interesting. A lot of questions are open now, and I'm sure, Jane, that is quite critical of the possibilities of having a, an agreement in these matters in WTO, probably contribute to have to create more uh, questions and also compare ideas that I think are, are useful for this discussion. Please, Jane. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, kia ora, good morning, good evening, well, where, whatever, wherever uh, you are. Um, uh, in a way, I, I think Hamid and I have been having this conversation now for a few months. Um, uh, as lawyers sometimes do, uh, trying to understand what the context is within which um, sometimes very arcane legal debates uh, can take place. And uh, of course, as, as he's made the point uh, on several occasions that these, uh, JSIs, including IF, uh, are, are part really of a, of a political idea, of a political project. Um, and when I talk with uh, delegations uh, involved and not involved uh, in the IF, uh, it's clear that the WTO legalities are an afterthought. Um, and in a way there has been an intention to build a, a momentum that would create a sense of, of legitimacy and almost inevitability around the JSIs and then work out what the legal issues and obstacles might be uh, to adopting them. And certainly when we're dealing with IF, of all of the JSIs, IF is the one that um, uh, faces the most legal obstacles, uh, although I would say that there are significantly more uh, than, than Hamid has, uh, has viewed. And, and I noted uh, he used quite often the term not being optimal uh, in his presentation. And I would say uh, it's actually more than they're not being optimal modes of adopting IF. There is no legal pathway for IF to be adopted in the WTO. Um, and you know, resorting to some of the uh, strategies um, that are, are now emerging uh, in terms of trying to find some interim mechanism um, is a bit of clutching at straws. Uh, to try to uh, placate some of the delegations that I've been hearing recently. And I, they've been very remote discussions because of where I am in the world, um, but who are frustrated that they've put significant resources into 
these negotiations uh, over several years now and uh, are simply now just finding that there are going to be problems uh, having them adopted. And so I think um, we need to locate IF uh, certainly in, in the broader question of uh, the framework and politics of what is happening in the realignment of WTO activities um, and attempting in a way to finesse the legal arguments um, by um, broader uh, political strategies. And, and I think we see that as well in the draft ministerial statement for IF uh, that's circulating at present, which is talking all the time about this being WTO members within the WTO, linking it to the MC12, um, e even though there is no clear legal pathway for its adoption. And so there's a lot of talking up that is still happening about this as a WTO strategy. And, and that includes the talking up of it as part of a development agenda. Um, I remember when it, uh, it first um, emerged as investment facilitation, of course, for those of us who work in the investment uh, agreement arena, that's a very controversial arena at present. And so um, not only was there an attempt to quarantine it from discussions around investor protection rules and around investor state dispute settlement, uh, but one of the initial movers, uh, and I see that the Brazilian delegation uh, is here today, uh, was from Brazil about the kind of alternative approaches that Brazil was adopting to dealing with um, issues of investment and, and their alternative forms of agreement uh, that focused much more on facilitation and mediation than on the arbitral uh, processes uh, that we saw in the investment agreements. Uh, but despite the, the um, suggestions that this had its origins in developing country initiatives, um, aside from some of the larger developing countries, um, it, it is pretty clear if we look through all of the drafts over time that the IF has been driven by capital exporting countries. And, and that raises some quite difficult questions uh, that underpin some of the legality arguments in the WTO, not just on IF, but on e-commerce and services domestic regulation as well. Um, because the development agenda that was uh, part of the payoff in the Doha round for a number of dead rats that were swallowed during the Uruguay round um, has, of course, not been concluded. And, and so in a way, the JSIs are, are being dressed up as being a part of, of a development strategy. But we have yet to see the kind of research uh, to underpin you know, what kind of investment this would attract, how these rules would uh, affect uh, the ability of, of countries to uh, vet the kind of investment that they really want to see in terms of development. And so there's a bit of sloganism that is happening around investment facilitation for development when we look at the text itself as merely involving transition periods and, and the prospect that there may be some resourcing available, uh, but on terms of the funding state uh, to support uh, developing countries making quite significant changes under IF when most of the capital exporting countries will in fact not have to do anything because it already describes what their systems do. And so I think when I, I turn in a moment to, to looking at, at some of the legal issues, we have to uh, recognize that there is an underlying concern amongst uh, a number of developing countries, uh, those not involved in the JSIs and those involved in the JSIs about what the overall implications would be of adopting this subgroup of members um, 
developing their own new sets of rules and the inability of developing countries to have matters of concern um, to them addressed. And that then brings me to uh, a number of, of the legal points, which I'll just uh, raise very um, briefly because you can read both of our papers and there are more extensive papers available as well. But I think the most fundamental question uh, in relation to IF is uh, whether in fact this is a legitimate topic for negotiations in the WTO at all. And yes, there have been um, references across, for example, to mode three in the gaps as being a part of, uh, uh, of investment already being uh, an element of the WTO. And there are references to the trade related investment measures and so on. But um, as one who's been hanging around uh, the WTO since the negotiations of the GATS itself, um, the original intention to include investment in the Uruguay round uh, was rejected. And, um, and, and that's how we ended up uh, in a way with services as a fallback position. Um, there have been attempts since then, right from the 1996 ministerial in Singapore through to Cancun in 2003, the July 2004 package and so on, to include investment on the agenda. And, and that has been rejected. Um, rejected uh, in the 2004 July package until the Doha round is concluded, a decision to be made then um, explicitly by consensus um, uh, and we aren't at that stage. So not only is there no mandate, uh, but there is a negative mandate. And there is a good reason uh, for that, which is that this is a world trade organization. And whilst one may want to expand its mandate, some countries may want to expand its mandate, that is not its core mandate. And if there is a decision to expand the mandate, it needs to be done uh, according uh, to Article 3.2 of the Marrakesh Agreement through uh, the decision-making processes of the WTO. Now, as uh, Hamid has pointed out, there are a significant number of problems if you bypass the, the, the negotiating mandate issues to look at adoption, uh, because whether we're talking about a new Annex 1 agreement or the adoption of a new Annex 5 on, on open plurilateralism, uh, it, that would need to be adopted according to the Marrakesh Agreement. Uh, and that uh, involves the practice of, of consensus decision-making. There is clearly no consensus. Um, and as I understand it, there is agreement uh, that going down the voting path would in fact create too dangerous a precedent uh, as a means of of adopting this JSI or indeed others. Annex 4 plurilateral would also require consensus uh, and there is none. There are a number of definitional problems as well. And, and we have to go back, I think, to the um, Marrakesh Agreement's um, uh, preamble to see that a part of the reason for the overall package in the WTO was to overcome the fragmentation that had begun uh, to occur with a variety of the plurilaterals that had uh, occurred under, under the GATT. And so the stress on multilateralism was not just uh, rhetorical, it, it was systemic uh, in terms of, of the objectives. Uh, and trying to redefine multilateralism to include now this open plurilateralism um, it is problematic to, to rewrite the rules that way requires either an amendment of the meaning of, of multilateral in all of the agreements, and that's a very complicated process, or the adoption of um, uh, an authoritative interpretation uh, under Article uh, 9.2, uh, which also is very complex. The schedules, there is a problem, more problems, I think, than, than Hamid uh, suggests, because schedules are not intended for adopting new rules. New rules are to be adopted by amendment processes, in particular of part two of the GATS, not through sectoral uh, commitments and schedules governed by parts three and four. 
Provisional application, um, I think that's a really long bow, um, especially because the Vienna Convention says treaties adopted within an international organization must be without prejudice to any relevant rules of the organization. Uh, and the pathway being suggested, I think most certainly would be. And I don't agree that, that either of the precedents that are cited help that. So where does that leave us? Um, I think for IF, it means that there is no pathway for adoption in the WTO. Um, adoption outside the WTO is a plurilateral agreement or perhaps as a set of guidelines adopted uh, amongst those who want to do so um, is probably the option that remains. Um, and so you know, I think there's an important discussion to occur amongst members, but also more broadly uh, about what the implications of this would be if there is still going to be pressure to adopt it inside the WTO, given the clear lack of legal pathway. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Jane. It's quite an interesting presentation. The issues of multilateralism and plurilateralism and all the FTAs that we have also put us in the position of what we should follow because all these topics are in the different spaces. So it's interesting to have that discussion. So I pass now the word to Jonathan Preet, also a person that knows quickly a lot of it, his recent participations and in, in, in uh, G20 also can give us some ideas of what is thought in those environments. So it will be interesting to listen to them. Jonathan. Um, Mercedes, thank you. And particular thanks to Hamid and Jane, not only for their very articulate uh, presentations, but the very thoughtful uh, and thorough uh, papers that were circulated in advance. Uh, I assume they're for public uh, consumption. Uh, if uh, we can pass them on to other uh, students and scholars, I think that would be of great uh, benefit. Um, let me begin by going back, because I think each of you have highlighted the political and economic context, and I take uh, some responsibility or paternity uh, for this. At the invitation of the government of China, I was the co-chair with China of the Trade and Investment Group in 2016. Uh, that ultimately developed the investment principles that I've now posted uh, in the chat. Uh, behind uh, that, and Hamid hinted at this, were even uh, pre-Trump's uh, election in the United States emerging tensions between East and West regarding uh, what was seen by some as lack of transparency by uh, receiving countries' investment review procedures, be it CFIUS or other screening mechanisms and so on. And this was viewed as a deterrent by some countries to promoting their own outward uh, FDI uh, opportunities. Um, on the other hand, of course, uh, the manner in which investment was regulated either pre or post establishment uh, was growing, uh, a growing concern among certain other countries. And thus, uh, in, uh, with trade and investment officials convened, uh, a very thorough set of discussions unfolded in the course of the year to look at the balance uh, between uh, the substance of investment regulation, to borrow Hamid's term on the one hand, and the process uh, of uh, investment uh, review. And coming from opposite sides, there, were, there was a general recognition that some of the basic principles going right back to the gap for trade and goods in Article 10, namely transparency, basic business values of uh, predictability and certainty uh, were goals uh, worth uh, promoting. What you folks skipped over a bit was the uh, very significant role played for some years in, uh, in zeroing in on these factors by UNCTAD. Um, uh, 
under Carl Savant and then later James Zhang, uh, quite a bit of attention and quite a bit of work underway. We are friends of multilateralism, uh, not just of the WTO. And at some point, it may be worth a broader look at uh, how UNCTAD's uh, ongoing uh, program uh, for investment promotion, investment facilitation, and investment regulation is very much a complement to what continues to be debated and unfolds at the WTO context. To take a, a very concrete example, UNCTAD conducts, although it's voluntary rather than mandatory in the WTO context, its own context, its own equivalent of a trade policy review, namely an investment policy review for any country that would like the benefit of peer review and secretariat analysis. And such reviews will look at the kinds of principles now being reflected in the JSI and offer very constructive advice and potentially technical assistance to help move countries along. So there is this history of an East-West uh, under, underlay uh, to this, but then as, as both of you pointed out as well, there's a North-South dimension also reflected in UNCTAD. As countries increasingly recognize that the global environment is indeed a competitive one to attract investment, there's national, uh, naturally self-interest on the part of many countries to improve their hosting environment and to show themselves as transparent, as predictable, as well-governed, uh, and so on. And again, UNCTAD provides uh, quite a bit of advice on how to go about doing that. And that's paralleled by quite a bit of work through the ITC, uh, UNCTAD, uh, and the IFIs on how to develop and uh, implement tra uh, investment promotion. Uh, agencies or activities within ministries and departments. And thus, as the JSI structured discussions in the WTO context have unfolded, I think it's fair uh, to remind that both of these motivations uh, curb the excesses of non-transparent interference with investment while respecting the legitimacy of national security and other essential domestic interest reviews on the one hand, uh, and promoting transparency on the other, but look for opportunities to help spread the wealth of FDI, which has slowed down even pre-COVID uh, as supply chains take hold in a manner that actually is in aid of uh, development. And there are some parallels to the philosophy of the trade facilitation agreement uh, underlying the JSI as well, which in effect hint at the desirability of accompanying uh, disciplines with capacity building to help countries actually live up to and deliver uh, on their commitments. So number one, I wanted to add both that uh, geopolitical, geoeconomic and institutional context vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, UNCTAD uh, and the G20 and a few other affiliated institutions, number one. Uh, and uh, number two, acknowledge that uh, the goals, frankly, uh, limited as they are to the process, are largely shared and largely reflect uh, principles, values, and disciplines already incorporated into the WTO by way of GATT and GATS on uh, uh, Article 10, Article 5, and, and so on, on, on transparency. Second uh, is also a, a political as well as process obligation, um, uh, observation rather. And this is something Hamid has written about and has been cited uh, <laughs> since he started uh, reminding people of the complexities of the issues back in 2017, because the, the issues we're debating on this JSI apply across the board uh, to other plurilateral uh, initiatives uh, in the offing and how uh, they either join or adjoin uh, WTO uh, rules and, and uh, discipline. So our discussion today is about a piece uh, 
of the puzzle as we look at uh, uh, JSIs from e-commerce uh, to domestic regulation uh, and who knows where we end up on a few other uh, affiliated uh, subjects. So that takes you back to uh, whether the cart leads the horse, whether this is all going to be tied up because we can't find a precise legal answer, or whether the political will to demonstrate a constructive approach uh, to building back from uh, COVID uh, by signaling the world is open uh, for renewed investment is really the underlying message that uh, uh, governments want to convey. Um, where there's a will, there's a way is a bit over uh, simplistic. But to take one extreme, and Alan Wolf and Peter and others will be much more expert than me. If you if you go the certification of schedules route, for example, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of submitted changes to tariff schedules have never been certified by the vast majority of members, and they've been sitting out there uncertified for decades. And yet the world carries on, the tariffs are respected and implemented. So in the real world, uh, even if the lawyers say, oh, it's sorry, not legal, no status without certification, uh, in achieving results and in countries wanting to be seen to living up to obligations, that may, in, uh, in practical terms, be a uh, path of least resistance. And as Hamid has pointed out, that's uh, an approach that's been used before uh, 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 in other subject areas where unilaterally countries have added uh, to their schedule. And I've got to say, just as, uh, as uh, somewhat retired now, but uh, <laughs> policy uh, operator, uh, frankly, uh, the behavioral constraint of knowing something's in your schedule, knowing that you've signed on, is itself uh, quite a discipline. Uh, and uh, whether you ever end up in dispute settlement or simply know there's going to be peer review, formal or informal, actually, if what you're aiming at is outcome, uh, does achieve the entire uh, result uh, that's being uh, sought. Um, so I'm not going to take up uh, any more time uh, other than uh, to say I very much welcome and no doubt John Adank and company will digest, add infinitum, the every line of your analyses, and of course stay neutral in his advice to <laughs> member delegations uh, in response, uh, but uh, I see this as uh, as I said, going back to 2016, the ongoing efforts that Carl and James Zhang, uh, Zhang uh, and others uh, are pursuing, as well as independently, I know Jeff Sachs and the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment uh, is on this bandwagon as well. I think it has momentum. I think it's a very complementary uh, set of disciplines uh, for, and undertakings uh, for the vast majority of countries that want, uh, as reflected in G20, Ottawa Group and elsewhere, want a return uh, to an environment that is with fewer restrictions, more transparency and uh, a forward direction. So uh, Mercedes, let me stop there, a bit provocative, but um, open as always to constructive criticism. And with thanks again to Jane and Hamid. Thank you very much, Jonathan, for your comments are really uh, opening our minds on issues that are important. In from coming from a developing country, Peru, I think the issues like UNTAC working on this uh, area is important. I used to work on this area several years ago. I was the first IPR that was made in Peru was it, when I, I participated. It was a very interesting process because, as you mentioned, as a country, we want to show off that we were able to receive with good rules uh, our, our invest, foreign investment in our country, and we're looking for that. Uh, and now we see a lot of the spaces in which uh, the treatment of FTA is, is, is focused. I mentioned the FTAs. All, many FTAs have some kind of provision uh, 
on, uh, on the treatment of FTAs and dispute settlements and things like that. So are there is a reality. And now, as you mentioned, for the accomplishment of, of the SDGs, uh, even the banks are intervening in terms of how the firms comply with best practices in terms of sustainability, uh, social, environmental, and, and governance of them. So it's interesting that this, this issue is there and we have to focus on that. And with that idea, I will open the door because I'm not a lawyer and I think the discussion was very important for lawyers, but also it has a lot of politi political issues there that should be addressed. And I think our participants should have a lot of questions on this. And the economic impacts also are important for us in, in the developing world, I think, to, to have this discussion with more clarity. So I open the floor. Please raise your hand and I will leave you the floor for the discussions and questions, please. No hands are raised yet. Alan, please. Just an observation from uh, US history with the GATT. Um, it took a quarter century for the US Congress to put into any statute that the GATT existed. Uh, it ignored it uh, as a formal matter. At the same time, uh, the most powerful committee chair, who was Wilbur Mills, was in charge of uh, trade policy for the um, uh, for the House of Representatives uh, would uh, entertain by giving a bottle of Coke to Olivier Long without a glass. Um, and uh, 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 Russell Long on the Senate side viewed Olivier Long as his quote cousin, which was very far from the fact if you knew Olivier Long or Russell Long. Uh, so uh, when Hamid says provisional application, um, or Jonathan says, uh, you know, uncertified schedules, but we live by them. The U.S. also lived by uh, the results of dispute settlement very often in the GATT days. Um, not always, but very often, um, despite the fact that uh, the uh, uh, reports might not have been um, adopted uh, or might be blocked. Uh, so there's sort of the this there's the legal construct, which Hamid has uh, discussed. There's also just practical effects. For the WTO, to, uh, when uh, Jonathan says, uh, well, we're FMG and the M doesn't just stand for uh, the OMC, um, it's very important if that uh, uh, the WTO be able to open its arms to new issues. Uh, there are many out there, including uh, climate change coming along. So um, uh, I think it's essential that the, a way be found forward. It may not be found by the lawyers initially, uh, but uh, I salute uh, the discussants and the and Hamid for uh, trying to find ways forward. Thank you, Alan. Any reaction, Hamid or Jane, about please, Hamid. Well, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I I definitely uh, agree with what Alan said now, and um, the the reality and the fact remains that we're talking about the rules. As lawyers, we try to unpack questions and try to clarify what the current rules say. But I consider this to be a useful starting point for a political conversation. I always say. And I think um, I know that Jane doesn't uh, uh, like this uh, statement very much, but I would say this is a political conversation in the first place. The rules were made by members and they can be changed by members. And the, uh, against the backdrop of everything that is happening uh, and has been happening in the WTO for the past 20 years, I would say, we've come to a point now where I think we would need to look at all the legal tools that we have in our toolbox as uh, tools for solutions that would lead us forward as opposed to um, constraints. Uh, and, and I think this is the kind of sort of legislative uh, 
legal uh, uh, sense that, that we need to um, you know, start promoting in our thinking. There are, while I have the floor, there are, there are two points that, that, that Jane mentioned, which I, I would like to go back to. One, at one point, she, I think she said, and she mentioned this in her paper as well, that, that schedules are not about rules. And I, I, I would like to understand what that means because uh, mm -hmm. schedules under the GATT is one thing where you have numbers and, uh, and tariff uh, rates, but, uh, but under the GATTs for services, um, schedules are about rules, particularly the scheduling of additional commitments. They, you can only schedule rules. So if we, if we draw that distinction, between schedules and rules, uh, I would I would fail to see how you can actually apply that in practice. Now I completely understand that we have an amendment article, Article 10, but that article is about amending the existing rules in the articles of the treaties that uh, form part of the the the, the treaty uh, system of the WTO. Uh, that's what Article 10 is for, but. When members, a member wishes to undertake uh, new obligations uh, under the GATS, the legal framework for that is, is provided for. And Article 18 of the GATS, under which rules are being scheduled, um, has no limitations. It, it's, it's about any measure that affects trade and services, except those that... Except those that are subject to scheduling under market access and national treaty. Now, of course, as I mentioned in my presentation, all this is governed by the overall scope of the agreement. The other point that Jane mentioned, I think, which I would like to go back to, is about uh, provisional application. I think the, the the article that you referred to in the Vienna Convention, which is Article Five, uh, is about the applicability of the Vienna Convention itself um, being without prejudice. Uh, to the rules of international organizations, but it's not about what governments may decide to do in a, in a sovereign way, even if this provisional application forms uh, a, um, a, a, a good faith uh, promise exchanged between the signatories of uh, such an arrangement until the actual entry into force of the agreement. So I, I, I don't see that this actually is becoming a constraint on, uh, uh, on a provisional application arrangement. But, but with that, I, I'd be happy to take any further questions. Back to you, Mercedes, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hamid. I think, Jane, you should take these questions at this moment. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mercedes. Um, uh, on the on the bigger picture, I, I think the the fundamental problem uh, was highlighted by Jonathan's input, which is that there are already a variety of institutional frameworks in which this conversation is taking place and are appropriate places for it to occur. It is not necessary, and I would say it's not actually appropriate to expand the WTO's remit into a variety of other areas that are of general interest in terms of international economic regulation. Um, the conversation uh, within UNCTAD on investment facilitation is occurring within a broader framework of discussions about international investment agreements, including investment chapters in, uh, in FTAs and so on. And it provides the flexibility to uh, engage with the adaptations that countries see appropriate uh, to deal with attracting investment whilst providing um, enough flexibility for them to adjust that over time without adopting legal obligations that may be uh, significantly beyond their capacity, but also um, whose link to attracting investment is in many ways speculative. And we've had these debates around investment agreements for years. 
to what extent do these kind of agreements actually have an influence on the decisions on investment? Uh, and, and so I think the WTO is not the appropriate forum uh, for that to occur, especially because it's a closed forum. IF is not open to external engagement, um, certainly in the way that UNCTAD is. Um, and you very rarely, except on some occasions when I and others have, have been engaged on panels like this, uh, hear the critical voices that you'd have in, in many other fora. Um, I, I won't go into, in, into detailed responses to Hamid's piece. I have a, an, an article that is coming out shortly, uh, Hamid, that uh, addresses in very significant detail the questions that you raise um, uh, about schedules. And, and I utterly disagree uh, with you that you can expand Article 18 uh, to become a generic rulemaking mechanism. It is a very specific sectoral based mechanism and general rules, for example, those in, in Article 6.1 on administration of domestic regulation uh, apply only to the uh, scheduled services, but they are general rules. And indeed, if we look at the domestic regulation uh, reference paper, a significant number of those are actually rules that are in part two of the GATS. And so they are effectively amendments to part two. They are not scheduling, um, uh, um, appropriately scheduling matters. Um, but we don't really want to bog the audience down in that. Um, and, and I would say in terms of Article 5 and Article 25 of the Vienna Convention um, and provisional application, you know, what can happen in the WTO is governed by the Lex Specialis of the WTO. And uh, there is no provision in, in the Marrakesh Agreement for provisional application. The precedents that are cited, I think, are not applicable uh, to the kind of situations discussed here. Um, but that's probably beyond the scope of, uh, uh, of, of the poor audience if you and I got down into the weeds of that. Great, Jane. Please, uh, Peter, you raise your hand. Thank you, um, and thanks for some very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, um, and um, although I listen with interest and uh, I, I get a sort of superficial understanding of what the issues are, but I'm certainly not going to dig into the Vienna Treaty or anything like that. My question is mainly addressed to Jane, and it's mainly addressed to the idea that the WTO should stick to its mandated um, realm of trade. And, and the question is, is, is specific. Do you think it's a bad idea to do fishery subsidies in the WTO? Because this is not, strictly speaking, about trade. It's not about unfair competition in subsidies. And although it may have a peripheral effect on trade, the objective is conservation of, of fish stocks, which is not normally the kind of thing that the WTO would deal with. So do you think that it's wrong to be discussing fishery subsidies in the WTO? Mm. Uh, thank you, Peter. I think that's a, a, a really, really important question. Um, and I think what we've started to see that we're having similar discussions around environmental goods and services, for example. Um, and we will have similar discussions around climate change. Um, and we are certainly having it on e-commerce and, and should regulation of the digital domain writ large be a matter for, for the WTO. Um, and the, the dilemma I think that underpins this is who has the power to decide what is on the agenda? And if we look back to the Uruguay round, who decided that services should be on the agenda? Who decided that intellectual property rights should be defined as a trade related issue? You know? And it's a question of the power asymmetries of who defines what is on the agenda. And so when we're looking at fish subsidies, yes, there was some agreement 
that this was going to be a matter to be discussed by an agreement by the membership. And then there have been debates about what, what is involved with that. As we know with environment, for example, there's not been agreement. Uh, I suspect we'll have similar issues with climate. There's not been agreement on e-commerce um, in terms of digital regulation. And so we're still with the 98 work program. And, and the resistance, as I understand it, from, uh, from a number of developing countries to the JSI process is that subgroups of powerful members will decide what should be the new issues on the WTO agenda. And the issues of importance to them will be relegated. Um, and so, yes, there are, if we look at the um, debacles around the fish um, uh, negotiations at present, real difficulties resolving matters even when there is agreement that there should be discussion on them. But expanding the WTO to a whole range of issues on which the membership is not agreed and allowing a group of more powerful countries to basically take their ball and set it up in a in an adjacent field, um, still under the same rubric of the WTO and with the resources of the WTO and with the DGs in premature, without there being uh, a consensus amongst the membership is, is a very dangerous direction. Um, and so I would differentiate the approach uh, in, in fish subsidies um, from uh, some of the other JSI issues that we're seeing and certainly some of the others that are uh, being um, advocated for at present. Thank you, Dan. It's seems because the, the, the fact that WTO has the possibility of sanctions is what probably moves a lot of people uh, talking about to, what to add to this discussion. And though I'm very close to the idea of having the fishery subsidies under control, uh, my country was very keen on that. <laughs> but the issue is that there is a characteristic of this multilateral environment that does, doesn't have any other one, which is the possibility of sanctions, the possibility of passing for the dispute settlement process and things like that. So where is the limit? And I think that Jane's position is interesting. Where is the limit in terms of what is the focus, focus of, our, our, of our agenda in WTO? Or where is the spaces in which we have to discuss these issues? So I would like to, to put the floor again into discussions. There's there more comments, questions. It will be interesting because this discussion is quite rich and I think suggested for more development in the future. Stuart has his hand up. Hand up. Stuart, please. Thanks very much, uh, Mercedes, and and uh, big thanks to um, Hamid and Jane and 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 Jonathan for. Uh, giving us a very, very rich diet. I mean, like Peter, I very much hesitate to get in the middle of a legal argument because I'm not a lawyer, but, you know, just reflecting on it as a former practitioner and a representative of a member, um, and not a very important member, um, you know, I, I think the membership... The way the way the WTO operates is that the members can be extremely pragmatic. They can do more or less anything they want if there's a consensus. And I've been racking my brains, but I haven't actually managed to come up with anything concrete. But the, I think there are many, many instances over the years of the members deciding to do things by consensus, which uh, may you know, be contradictory with something they, they decided previously. But that's the nature of the of the organization. And the other reflection I had listening to the presentations was that and I think maybe Jonathan might have mentioned this as well, is that the members are very proprietorial about their own schedules. And the idea that, you know, I can't do something to my schedule because there's not a consensus on it is, I think, a bit of a hard sell to most members. You know, they, they feel uh, quite possessive about their schedules and uh, they'll do with them what they want. Um, and of course, yeah, well, there are you know, procedures for uh, 
objections during the process of certification, but there are a lot of uncertified schedules out there, um, as has been said. I mean, I'm not sure if the EU has a, a certified services schedule yet because it keeps changing and uh, it's it's been decades um, and we still don't have a certified EU services schedule. So, but, but then life goes on, as Jonathan said. Um, I think the idea for a member that there has to be consensus at every step of the journey before you can do something to amend your schedule is, is not one that a lot of members would really find very acceptable in my view. Thanks. Hamid, please. Thank you, Mercedes. Uh, just to follow up on, on the point made by, uh, by Stuart regarding schedules, I think, you know, what, what we're trying to do in a, in a conversation like this, and I don't want it to be too legalistic, really, because uh, we're just trying to clarify the rules where we stand today. Uh, and you, you might have noticed in my, uh, in my um, interventions and presentations, I'm not trying to second guess the policy or political choices of members because I do have my views about what would be good for the system and what the future would bring. But, but, uh, but I think this conversation is about unpacking the rules as they stand and see what kind of solutions we, we might have there. And this is important with respect to the schedules. And what Stuart mentioned about the, the, the members being uh, looking at, uh, at their schedules very jealously the way that he's right. But, but the other point also is that even members themselves have collectively acted to adopt procedures and rules that would allow each and every member to improve their schedules voluntarily. And we have so many cases of that. And those improvements have entered into force in accordance with the agreed procedures. So the a member unilaterally improving its commitments and its schedule is not just a concept, it's actually something for which there are agreed rules and procedures. Now, if a, if a member could do that individually, why not a group of members could do it collectively? And we've seen that, there are cases of that as well. So keeping that in mind, I think might sort of help us going forward when we think about the legal tools as opposed to the political uh, choices that, that we might be looking for in the future. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question posed by Peter. He said, follow up, if it boils down to the power to decide what's on the agenda, uh, doesn't that take it out of the legal dimension and into the political dimension? Well, it's like reiterating the same issue. Um, if, if I could respond to that, I think uh, part of the reason why we're now having more and more legal discussions in the context of the JSI is the point I made earlier about the power asymmetries in the organization. And if you're going to view the organization um, as being driven by politics, then um, as the, as the elephants dance, um, there are a very large number of, uh, of less uh, powerful players who will get um, crushed in the process, uh, or certainly whose interests and concerns are, are not going to be addressed. And I think part of the discussion that we've been having about what are the legal options that are available um, to address uh, the JSI developments reflect the fact that legalities become a point of defense for those who don't have political power in a structure. And those legalities were developed in the Marrakesh Agreement to seek to provide some assurances, some frameworks in which the members committed to act. And, and so, you know, the, the legalities is not just a bunch of lawyers deciding that we want to be lawyers, um, but that the rules actually matter. Um, and the rules were developed for 
for a certain reason. And, and I would um, use a similar uh, argument in relation to Hamid and, and, and the services schedules. And I, if we look at certification processes for schedules, um, the process is not a consensus. It's a, you know, it's, it's a silent consensus, I suppose, if, if no one objects. But if you look at the, the processes, um, and there are two mechanisms uh, for certification and objections, if it ends up in arbitration, as it possibly can, if there's no resolution uh, between an objecting country and a, a country want to amend its schedule, um, that is simply about recalibrating the uh, request and offer uh, obligations that were adopted when the schedule was developed. It's clearly not about the developing of generic rules. And where there have been rules that have been adopted in schedules under Article 18, they have been sectoral. Reference paper on, on basic telecoms, for example, financial service, and that the, the uh, mandate for them was agreed to. The mechanism for adopting them was agreed to. It's not this backdoor entry of trying to amend the rules and add new rules uh, through this process of amending schedules. Yes, of course, members can, um, can amend uh, schedules that are specific commitment schedules under part three but they can't do so to change the rules in part two. And, and that's because there is an amendment process. Um, and, and so uh, Hamid and I, I'm sure, will continue to argue this on paper and in person over the next um, year or two. Maybe I won't be in Geneva, but I'm sure he will be, but we will have some panels that will be debating that there is, is the domestic regulation disciplines pose the first test. Thank you, Dan. Please, Lou. Yeah, thank you, Mercedes. And a lot of thanks to both Hamid, Jane, and Jonathan for really enlightening conversation. Um, uh, I was first trained as an economist and then as a lawyer. And I remember vividly when I was in the university studying laws, and my, I asked my question, what should I do after graduate? I was still in uh, Ministry of Commerce of China. And he simply answered that uh, find a problem, or if you not, uh, create a problem and then provide a solution. So I always remember that. A joke aside, I think here what we have done excellently is really identify uh, really various problems along, uh, side, along the plurilateral, around plurilaterals. Uh, and but we we don't have a common sense yet about how to to go forward from there. I mean we have both sides totally different opinions. Uh, so if I, allow me, maybe we can relate to what we are doing now to a previous session by FMG when we also discussed about plurilaterals more generally, and we have invited also uh, some developing uh, ambassadors to to share with us what to say. So what I heard vividly from that conversation was uh, one ambassador who was body of, of GSI uh, simply quite uh, frankly uh, say that uh, we're not going to wait, we have to move forward. So we are going to do GSI's one way or the other, uh, with or without you, uh, inside or outside that too. And Jane, in your uh, conclusion uh, of your first intervention, you also say that, uh, well, the WTO, there's no pathway, but the, the one option could be that do this outside the WTO. So my, I was wondering when I heard about this, I was wondering if we see more and more JSIs happening outside the WTO and directly or indirectly, there will be huge impact on the rights of the obligations of members, even uh, I mean, so so my sense, my question immediately would be, uh, would that be an ideal situation for those non-participants? Uh, and then how would that be like for them uh, in the future if more and more are happening outside? So I'm, uh, this is a question to all of you, not specifically to Jen. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Uh, 
Thank you, Lou. And well, we have five minutes uh, to end this hour. So please, all the three of, of, of our discussions are invited to, to participate and make their comments. Well, go ahead, Jane. Well, I, I suppose it depends on how important you think multilateralism is. Um, I mean, when it comes to some issues, I think there are other fora that are more appropriate. And, and I think it was um, important when Jonathan raised the UNCTAD uh, example uh, about a location in which uh, certain issues uh, may be more appropriately addressed. I'm certainly not advocating that we have um, an expansion of the mega regionals uh, in which we, if we look at the con at RCEP versus the CPTPP, we see uh, two very different models there, leaving, <laughs> leaving aside the question of, of, of China uh, wanting to accede to the CPTPP. Um, and so I think that the, the objective of multilateralism, from my understanding, is to ensure that less powerful countries actually have their issues addressed. And I think what we've seen happen with the Doha round uh, already portends very badly uh, for the WTO's ability to do that. Uh, and the JSIs in the WTO would intensify that problem. Um, and I think we need to look equitably at other locations in which um, development issues and concerns can genuinely be addressed without the power plays uh, that we're seeing with the JSIs. Thank you, Jane. Jonathan? Um, well, Hamid deserves the last word, so I'll intervene in between. Um, look, if you approach this from a lawyer's perspective, uh, a public international lawyer would uh, talk about the spectrum from treaty law to soft law and everything in between. We have internationally in various fora various degrees, I won't say of bindingness, but of coercive uh, impact. If you take the developed countries in an OECD context, the number of peer reviews of public embarrassment without any formal dispute settlement thereafter uh, works for codes of capital movements and therefore in the investment field. Uh, works uh, in many, many other areas. APEC does something very similar uh, in terms of voluntary inventories and notifications aided by a secretariat, specialized groups. And I think, Lou, you can correct me, at last count, there's 88 different tables under APEC uh, where these kinds of things uh, can take place. And coming right back to the WTO or WTO related context, political declarations themselves unilaterally have some impact. Uh, what trade ministers and their leaders have been saying about uh, COVID related supply chains, about the need and commitment to be temporary, transparent and proportionate in the measures they may need to undertake has a conditioning impact. And if it's done in Geneva, whether on or off premises, that's a contribution to the evolution of what may become harder rules. Where these joint statement initiatives uh, fit along that uh, spectrum is going to vary. I use the G20 investment principles as an example. You can take the Osaka Declaration on uh, uh, free flow of data with trust, uh, as a guidepost uh, that serves to hold uh, other countries to account in, in diplomatic uh, discussion. So I just wanted to put in a final uh, comment, put all of this along a spectrum as we consider what governments are trying to say, trying to communicate both to their business communities, foreign investors and expectations of other countries as well. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And then I pass the last word to Hamid. Now, without thanking everybody for their participation, particularly our discussions, and, and all the comments that we have there in the chat that are very rich also for the 
and, and can we help us to reach the discussion? Thank you, Hamid. Well, thank you so much. Uh, and and um, I, I have not been talking about political choices or, or policy choices of members so far, but I, I would therefore allow myself just to say one last thing. Uh, I think we are at a point now where we're, what we're looking at really is the survival of the system, whether the system will survive. I think I, I personally believe that we are in a very, very unprecedentedly serious situation with respect to the state of, of the WTO, the multilateral trading system is all. And then what should we do? I think we should be more purpose driven about how to um, help the system. We know that interests um, uh, of all members are only served by negotiated outcomes. Uh, and uh, here we have an institutional challenge that I think we should think about you know, more carefully and more seriously. We have 164 members of the WTO who have equal legal rights and equal status, yet very unequal capacity to negotiate. And I, I sympathize very much and I recognize the challenge that developing countries and small countries are facing. It's not just about their political weight and political power, but it's also about the capacity to negotiate. Now, while Looking at this problem, I would say we need to really address this seriously, seriously. Capacity building and technical assistance, but of a very different nature from the kind of sort of perfunctory way it, it's been happening. On the other hand, solving this challenge or facing this challenge by blocking the system is not going to help anybody. If we continue to block the system, it will break completely and it will not serve anybody's interest. So my, the last thing I would say here is that let's look at all the legal issues and all the, what we have in our toolbox, but with a problem solving attitude and see how we can move this forward because we're really, really in a very, very um, tricky situation right now. And with that, um, uh, I leave you with a lot of optimism, <laughs> having said what I said, we have to be optimistic and, um, and, and Good luck for, for us all. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And, and I pass now the voice to Lou to close the session. Fantastic. Thank you very much for all your great comments. Yeah, no, uh, thanks uh, in particular to you, Mercedes, for so ably moderating this uh, session and on such a complicated issue. Uh, thanks also goes to, to Hamid Jane and Jonathan for really enriching the discussion. Of course, as we say that, uh, we still have a lot to discuss uh, and we still kind of are looking forward for MSTEL, which possibly may come up with quite a, some, uh, uh, either results of some plurilaterals or some new plurilaterals. Uh, so we have to follow this closely uh, and then trying to see how we could uh, uh, move ahead with different opinions, uh, and of course, uh, so I, I definitely our group will will we'll try to organize more in the future on one of them or, or all of them together in gen generally. Uh, so thanks a lot for the, the uh, to the participants also, uh, and we look forward uh, to next time. Thank you very much, and wish uh, the delegations who are present today a uh, 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 very fruitful, hopefully fruitful, and helpful. And I think. Uh, by then, uh, FMG will will probably be be not whole, uh, organizing any more uh, sessions, uh, not until after it's held, of course, so as that you have time to to spend uh, on only MS twelve. So thanks a lot, and to all of you, and we look forward to see you after MS twelve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone.